Um, mostly I'm going to be working on the, in this course on the um, women focusing on the girls, but uh, I would like to look at the way that men also saw women, because that's uh, it's, it's, uh, important in its own way. And the period that we're looking at here, the 17th century, is particularly a period when um, you know, uh, women are being uh, more direct. We, we already saw Jane Anger. Uh, we don't really know if her name really was Anger or if she used that name to, but it is a theology, it is a, it is a possible name that she could possibly be, have been called Anger. Uh, we don't know if it really was her name or, or uh, we don't know anything about her. But you can see how, uh, you know, even in the 16th century, some women are, are being quite uh, challenging towards men. So, um, how did men react towards that? Well, this would be a period in which we might quite reasonably talk about um, male anxiety. Uh, male anxiety is a kind of accompanying narrative to the narrative of um, women asserting themselves in society, uh, taking over territory or entering into territory that was previously considered male. Um, so you get the playwright Ben Johnson, for example, complaining about ladies that live from their husbands. Okay, they, they kind of, uh, they live off their husbands. Um, uh, they cry down or up what they like or dislike in a brain or a fashion with most masculine or rather hermaphroditical authority. So he's, um, he feels threatened, I suppose, by these women who live off their husbands and who cry up and down uh, and say exactly what they think and feel. And uh, this fear that, that women were usurping men's roles is, is reflected in, well, many, many different kinds of uh, Okay, um, yeah, the, the uh, male anxiety that we see in, in uh, Ben Johnson, okay, with uh, ladies that live from their husbands and cry down or up uh, in, a, in a most masculine, or hermaphroditical means having the qualities of both men and women, or having the qualities of both sexes. So, uh, um, bloody stupid microphone. I'll change it for, for a different one. Um, okay, so, uh, that's actually not a, um, not English, that's actually uh, a Dutch engraving from 1638. But it, uh, I think it kind of gives us an idea of the kind of um, thing that, that, that we're talking about. Okay? Um, she's, uh, she's not exactly masculine, is she? But she's very hermaphroditical. She's not ashamed to show her breasts in public, uh, which apparently was, you know, breasts were not completely taboo in the way that they are today. So you might see breasts in public in uh, 16th, 17th century uh, England. I'm not saying it was all that usual, but it, 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 it could happen. Um, but she obviously, she just doesn't care, does she? She, she, <laughs> she smokes uh, in a very masculine sort of way. Uh, you imagine she's not going to be easy. Uh, she's not going to be the kind of sunal, uh, docile female that, um, you know, would conform to stereotypes. So, uh, yeah, uh, an aspect of that also would be um, transvestism, um, the whole issue of uh, men dressing as women or women dressing as men. Uh, surprisingly, because in our society, men dressing as women is quite taboo. I mean, people would sort of see that as rather, well, unusual, curious, all right? It's not something that people would generally... I mean, you, you do occasionally see male transvestites looking over the streets, but it's not something that people, I mean, yeah, most people would kind of uh, not 
walk onto the streets dressed in women if they were male, would not be walking on the streets dressed in women's clothing. And yet, in the early modern period, uh, it was just not seen as particularly bothersome that men should dress as women. Far more uh, bothersome to them was the idea that women would dress as men. Because again, that was women challenging okay, male territory. Women sort of saying, I can do this too. I can take over your territory. And that was seen uh, in quite, as quite a serious thing. It could lead to women being whipped as a punishment. It could lead to, uh, it could lead to trouble, basically. Um, and of course, you know, if you think about it, in the theatre anyway, all through the theatre, we'll take a look at the theatre a little bit later on, but looking at the theatre, um, you know, all the female characters were acted by men anyway, weren't they? So people were used to seeing men dressed up as women, all right, because of the theatre. But the other way around, no, that was more dubious. That was more of a, a worrying thing. Um, so, uh, yes, if you look at these two uh, pamphlets on uh, the man-woman and the reply to it on, on the, the, the womanish man, um, you can see a sort of um, sex role, gender issue going on in the early modern period. All right, these, these two pamphlets date from 1620. So uh, that kind of issue would be uh, significant at that time. Uh, we are as freeborn as men, have as free election and as free spirits. We are compounded of like parts and may with like liberty make benefit of our creation or, or our creations, our existences, our, the fact that we exist, that we're here. We have the same right to enjoy our life and to live our life as, as men have. All right? Uh, so you've got the, um, the man, woman, and the woman, man, and the, the, the gender assertions of women uh, that we have the right to to kind of live our lives in the same way as men do. Um, and this, uh, this fear that uh, men were usurping men's roles is also reflected, uh, well, as I say, it's reflected in the uh, male transvestitism as being regarded as ser a serious tran transgression. Um, Whereas uh, male transvestitism was generally regarded as harm. Unsex um, me here. And also, you can see in things like uh, that's Lady Macbeth, okay? Make, um, and I'm sorry, yeah, the volume has gone here. Yeah, she is actually saying, unsex me here at that point. That's what she's supposed to say. It didn't come through because it, the volume doesn't seem to be working. I've forgotten those that little bit. But she's saying, unsex me here. Um, if you look at uh, the, the, the prints, um, I'm saying this shows a darker side. It, it wasn't just a question of like, oh, you know, if women like to dress up as men and women like to be a bit um, assertive in the streets. No, it, it's much more serious than that. This has some very heavy implications. Okay, when, uh, when she says, unsex me here, and she says, come to my women's breasts and well, my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, She's opening up her woman's heart to cruelty and evil. She's, um, she's aligning herself with uh, the, the witches who have tempted Macbeth. And uh, this is a much darker side of the whole process. I really wish the, the volume would work uh, because I, I've put in a few other sound effects that are, are not going to come through because of this. Um, so. Sorry about that. Uh, when you, if you listen to it on the um, on the website, you'll get all the full sound effects of cackling witches and all the all the fun and games. But it doesn't seem to be working at all. And I don't know why not. But uh, we don't seem to have any audio volume here. Has somebody turned it off? Perhaps no. No, it's on. But I don't. I just don't know. I don't know why it's not working. Um, doesn't seem to be anything. Uh, doesn't seem to be anything that explains why that's not working. Uh, okay then. Well, anyway, I shall just carry on. Um, so uh, yeah, it raises the spectre of, of, of witchcraft. Um, 
even more than the 16th century, the 17th century was the time in England in particular when witchcraft, witches were persecuted, uh, women in particular, occasionally uh, you know, men were accused of, of witchcraft, but it was mostly a thing that women were um, accused of, and hundreds of them were put to death. So uh, that's a, um, this, this issue of witchcraft is, is a kind of dark side. Is it, yeah, has everybody signed the attendance register? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a much more uh, serious issue. Obviously, people are dying here. People are being um, not burned because they didn't burn witches in England, they burned witches in other parts of Europe, uh, but people were being um, hanged. Okay. Uh, that was the, and, they, and of course tortured, they were usually tortured first to make them confess and then they would be uh, hanged as this picture shows. Right. So uh, it, it, was, it was quite a serious issue. Um, why this thing about women being witches, why it came up is, a, I don't know, it's a, there's a lot of argument or discussion about why it became such a big thing at this time. Um, you know, it had been going on for a few hundred years. The idea of witches had grown up in Europe um, in the Middle Ages, but it, it really seemed to kind of have a, a big, you know, boom in, in the idea of witchcraft in the early modern period. Part of it could be because of Christian culture, where according to the Bible, it was a woman who accepted the apple from the, from the snake and gave it to Adam in the Garden of Eden. So women were more easily, by this theory, women were more easily tempted by the devil. Women were more easily uh, corrupted. And so women were more suspicious or more to be suspected of evil than, than men were. Uh, that's one of the explanations that's... that's uh, frequently put forward, but to be honest, it's it's, um, it's something that they're still trying to work out. You know why why there was this uh, terrible fear of women during that early modern period. Um, yeah, women were seen as being driven by their uh, physical desire. It's curious because in the nineteenth century, you got the sort of the opposite view that, that, that it's men who have physical desires and the women are just sort of passive creatures by comparison. Uh, the early modern period was not like that at all. And it's important to understand how, you know, in different periods, uh, ideas ch about women changed so radically. Uh, one male writer in the late 16th century says, uh, he, uh, this is, this, he publishes a book, really, he, he obviously hates women very deeply. He talks about the common scum of women. Okay. Uh, Women are, are, are rubbish. Uh, they're so proud, so foolish, so shrewish, so imperious over their husbands. And for enticements of the flesh and proneness to lust of such an untamed and unbridled concupiscence, uh, that means, um, yeah, they, they're so filled with desire and pa passionate desire that they may well be tired, but never satisfied with the act of venery. Yeah, they did a very open sort of talk here. They, 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 may, they may be tired with uh, so much um, well, act of sex, okay, copulating, but they'll never, they'll never be satisfied. And it's really kind of brutal talk, and it's very direct and sexual. It's very explicit uh, about um, you know what, what he thinks uh, women are, and you can see a, a tremendous underlying hatred. In a, in a text like that, and it's not, not so uncommon in that period to read that kind of response to women. So, um, this, uh, the, 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 the other thing that might play some part in this would be the, the way that people saw that the medieval period, or looking back two or three hundred years ago, uh, people could have a sort of image of a kind of orgong jidai for men. All right, when um, the man would kneel before his lady uh, in a sort of symbolic gesture, all right, or reversing the, 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 the usual position of male power, 
uh, he would place himself at her feet, um, but, but she would graciously accept him. This was convention, this was, these were the rules of the game. If the courtly love was following a very um, kind of well-established pattern of rules, where the man will put himself at the woman's knees, but she will accept him. Okay? But that's all breaking down in this age, where she, instead of accepting him, she may very well just laugh at him. Okay? Or reject him in some way. So you've got uh, the man, the male anxiety is very much more um, evident because uh, you've got, uh, instead of the, the kind of normal pattern of male kind of superiority, or normal, normal, the established medieval pattern of male superiority, you've got a kind of challenging of that from various directions, uh, partly uh, based on religion and partly based on the changes in social customs. So, uh, yeah, this would be the, the courtly expectation in the uh, mid Middle Ages. Uh, she's going to gracefully accept his advances. That's the accepted pattern. Well, whether that was really what the medieval period was like, well, that's a different question. I'm not going to go into whether it was always like that in medieval times or not. The point is that for people uh, looking back on it from the point of view of the 17th century, that's how they imagined it. That's what they thought it was like. Okay? And why isn't it like that now? Why we seem to have lost our... Men seem to have lost the opportunity to be heroes in the same way as they felt medieval men could be. And so uh, that would be another cause of uh, anxiety, looking back on an age when supposedly men were men and women were women. So uh, separating the uh, 17th century from the ideal age, as they imagined it, of the medieval period, was the 16th century. In the 16th century, as we saw last week, it had its powerful uh, kings and queens, uh, so, uh, but, but particularly, it's, uh, it started with Henry VIII, of course, a powerful king, but you have these powerful women all the way through the 17th century, particularly Mary and Elizabeth. And you've got those heroic religious martyrs, some of whom were women, uh, and uh, particularly, they were held up as an example to people. You, you should uh, be able to suffer the same way as they did. So again, it was a sort of challenge. Can you not even be as good as a woman? Can you not even suffer as much as a woman could? Uh, would be a, 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 a typical taunt in those days. So, um, on the one hand, this gave 17th century women some very inspiring role models. Okay, we can be like those heroic women. We can be like um, the, women, the female martyrs. We can be like the, um, the, 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 the strong, powerful queens of the 16th century. And men, on the other hand, found themselves being compared unfavorably to those female role models. And uh, it was a challenge to their sense of uh, male supremacy. Uh, you get Samuel Butler, for example, um, who, like Johnson, paints a picture of women asserting themselves, women taking over from men. Uh, in his very famous poem, uh, it's satirical. It's satirical. It's very hard to know what Butler is, you know, where he actually stands in all of this. But he he shows um, a society when all the breaches, greedy women fight to extend their vast dominion. When wives, their sexes shift like hairs and ride their husbands like nightmares. For when men by their wives are cowed, their horns, of course, are understood. Now, the horns are uh, what, what meant um, cuckoldry. Cuckoldry means um, a man's wife is sleeping with another woman. He is a cuckold. A cuckold is a man whose who's wife is sleeping with another, with, another, with another man. Okay? That's a cuckold. Uh, and it was symbolized by the horns. I, 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 uh, in some European cultures, they still use the horns like that to mean your wife is sleeping with, with, an, with another, another man. So, um, 
we don't use that so in, in, in modern English, but uh, it's still used in some parts of Europe and Spain. Um, and yeah, he's talking about uh, you can't trust women. You never know what they're doing behind your back. They're probably tricking you. Uh, it's, it's a very, very kind of popular theme for the early modern period. You think, it were, was there a happy couple anywhere? Was there ever any trust between, between man and woman at that time? You, you're constantly coming across this kind of um, misogyny, really. Uh, a sort of male suspicion of and hatred of uh, women. So, uh, sexual insecurity was uh, an important part of that male anxiety. And uh, as I say, suppose you go down on bended knee to your sweetheart and then she, she refuses you, or she mocks you, or, or even if she accepts you, but then afterwards she sleeps with other men. All of these things, this kind of uncertainty and doubt, um, this feeling that uh, women were not to be trusted and that a man's uh, main fear in life was to be betrayed by, by women. Uh, all of this runs very deep during this period. Um, here's a female poet, okay, uh, from the late, late 17th century, Mary Barker, and she shows exactly that picture, a rejected lover. She's taken it from a classical tale, but she emphasizes the, the anxiety, she emphasizes the rejection, the stress. O oh, cruel nymph, okay, the nymph is the beautiful woman, and the, um, this is the man's complaint against the cruel nymph, the cruel woman. Why dost thou thus delight to torture me? Why thus my sufferings slight? My mournful songs neglected are by thee. Thou art regardless of my verse and me. Thou canst behold with an unpitying eye my sorrows, and art pleased to see me die. So, um, a lot of the, the poetry of this time, uh, again, deals with this kind of theme of the unrequited male lover, the, the man who approaches the woman but she refuses him and, and, and seems to enjoy refusing him, all right? Seems to take a certain kind of perverse pleasure in it. And this, of course, actually has more impact. It's actually written by a woman. Uh, so uh, you can see that this is quite an important theme for that period. Uh, the way that Barker takes on this narrative voice uh, really uh, gives a sense of female empowerment in gender relations, because she's writing this as a woman. And we can find lots of examples of women showing that kind of awareness in uh, the literature written by women during the 17th century. And uh, Afra Ben, who we'll come back to uh, a little bit later on in more detail, uh, is perhaps the most striking of these. Afra Ben was perhaps the first woman to earn her living as a writer. Right? So she should be big on your map. All right, Afra Ben, the first, probably the first professional write, female writer in, in English. And uh, one of her poems is quite extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's often said that the, you know, the 17th century was um, more open, more frank about sexual topics, uh, and that by, by the time you get to the 19th century, uh, it, sex of any kind is sort of very, very taboo. So um, it's often said that, that you know, before the 18th century, uh, uh, Foucault, with, uh, the French um, right, writer and philosopher Foucault um, talks a lot about this, about how the 17th century was a much more open, sexually open kind of time, and that things became more and more you know, repressed until you get to the Victorians, uh, which is the ultimate sort of hypocritical, re repressed society. Um, but in her poem, The Disappointment, she, again, she's, she's, she's taking a classical theme um, but her treatment of it is uh, very, very frank, very, very open. Um, she's describing in, in very close, very intimate detail a man's failure to, 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 to have an erection. And it's very, very directly sexual. 
quite shocking. I, mean, yeah, I don't know if it's shockingly so, not from maybe not from a 21st century point of view, where uh, sex is talked about much more openly. But I mean, what the Victorians would have thought of it, all right? Um, and it's a woman who's writing it. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details of the uh, of the poem, but it ends it ends with these uh, these lines. Um, he cursed his birth, his fate, his stars, but more the shepherdess's charms, whose soft, bewildering influence had damned him to the hell of impotence. Impotence meaning not being able to, 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 to perform the sexual act. So, uh, when I say that, you know, she, she's very frank and open about it, you have to read it yourself um, in order to believe me. You have to actually think, oh, he's just reading things into it. No, no, it's, it's very clear, very direct, very explicitly stated. Okay, so uh, this is something else to think about. At the same time as there's all this kind of misogyny and apparent hatred of women, people talked much more openly about sex than you would expect in the 17th century. Okay, you, you think of the Victorian period when sex was kind of more completely taboo, um, and you, you sort of think, oh, we are, we, we, we changed, you know, the, the, the 1960s with all its sort of, you know, peace and love kind of message, that, that changed society. But no, this is sort of a wave that goes up and down, all right? Um, and in this particular respect, uh, the 17th century was much, much more open than the 19th. Okay, so uh, there was a lot more frankness. Um, open writing about sex. Uh, they didn't have the idea at this stage of pornography. That comes in in the 18th century. All right, so they didn't they didn't really uh, look at uh, sexual writings uh, with the idea of oh that's pornographic. Okay, that idea only starts to come in really in the uh, 18th century. So uh, yeah, people wrote quite frankly in that period, and certainly. Um, Afro Ben in that particular poem uh, is very explicit. Um, right. So, all of that is probably pretty surprising given what I was talking about last week, which was that really mostly until the um, you know, end of the 16th century, nearly all the writing that we have from women was, was religious. Things have certainly changed, haven't they, in a fairly short period of time. I'm not saying that there was no religious writing, there was religious writing going on at that time, but um, there was all this kind of uh, gender and highly gendered uh, writing that women were engaging in. Uh, of course men were too, but women were taking their place alongside men in uh, these very gendered uh, stories, narratives, um, debates, discussions. Uh, it, it's operating on a variety of levels. And uh, I'm going to focus later on in this lesson on the Countess of Montgomery's Urania, uh, which is a very, very long prose romance in two parts. The first part was published uh, in 1621. The second part was never published. Um, not, not until you know, much, 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 you know, hundreds of years later. Um, and uh, Mary Roth was the niece of Mary Sidney. Remember, we, we looked at Mary Sidney last week, the most famous female writer of the uh, 16th century. Um, and Mary Sidney, of course, was best known for her translations of the Psalms, which she composed with her brother Philip, and so she's, she's in that sort of religious writing area. But at the same time, her, 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 her brother had written um, the um, Arcadia, which was uh, a romance. And in that sort of romance tradition, uh, um, Mary Roth writes uh, the Urania. Uh, so, um, we don't know to what extent uh, her aunt, uh, Mary Sidney, may have uh, influenced her brother in his writing, um, but uh, they were very, she was very close to her brother, and she made her edition of his work after his death. So um, clearly, um, Mary Roth was influenced by, by this uh, aspect of her family history. 
And uh, yeah, as I say, the 18th century was when the idea of pornography as such sort of actually came in, and books were forbidden because of their sexual content. But there was very little kind of public reaction in 1621 when this uh, quite explicit work uh, was published. Um, the sexual content doesn't seem to have bothered them all that much. And yet, the book was prohibited. It was withdrawn from publication, but not, not apparently because of its sexual content. It was withdrawn from publication because it, it uh, painted a libelous picture of uh, a well-known politician. And he said, look, that, that, that character who's being negatively shown in, in that book is clearly meant to be me. And I'm going to take this to court, and I'm going to fight to have this book removed from publication. And it was. So it was removed from publication because it was apparently libelous, uh, not because it was considered uh, immoral. Okay? But uh, she had based her fantasy story uh, too closely on a real-life person that she wants to show in a negative way. And so the book was withdrawn from publication for that reason. Um, I'll just look here at one of the most famous passages from Maria Aurelia, where the hero Parcellius and his sweetheart Pamphylia come across a villain who is tormenting his wife, uh, Limena. Now, um, the story begins with Limena's lover, and we'll look at that um, outside the PowerPoint presentation uh, later on in this lesson. But this scene where they come across this man torturing his wife is uh, one of the most famous scenes in Mary Roth's book. It's uh, this, this is part of the description. Leading the, the, um, okay, the villain who's tormenting his wife is leading her to a pillar which stood on the sand. He tied her to it by the hair, which was of great length and sunlight brightness. Then pulled he off a mantle which she wore, leaving her from the girdle upwards all naked. Her soft, dainty white hands he fastened behind her with a cord about both wrists, in a manner of a cross, as testimony of her cruelest martyrdom. While she was thus miserably bound to his unmerciful liking, with which he was about to torment her. So this is one of several passages like this in uh, Urania. Well, of course, they, they rescue her from her cruel husband, but then she goes on to explain all the terrible things that he's done to her. Uh, then did he command me to go with him to my death, I hope. Okay, he's, he's, he's taken her away, and he's leading her into the, the woods, and uh, she hopes he's going, just going to kill her. All right? The reason he's doing this is because uh, he knows that she has a lover although she hasn't actually slept with this lover, uh, she knows, he knows that she's in love with another man. And so he, he, he commands me to go with him, and he brought me to a great wood in the midst whereof he made a fire. Then he made me undress myself, which willingly and readily I did. When I had put off all my apparel but one little petticoat, he opened my breast and gave me many wounds, the marks you may here yet discern, letting the mantle fall again a little lower to show the cruel remembrance of his cruelty. So she's sort of showing off the breasts that he's damaged, okay, to, to, to the listeners. So all of this is, you know, quite disturbing, because this is the first major novel written by a woman, and it seems to be, you know, for the male gaze, to titillate the male gaze. At least these passages do. So feminist critics have had a, a really difficult time with this. But the first, the first um, major novel, well, the first novel of really of any kind, written by a woman, uh, contains passages like this. Okay, um, critics, uh, feminist critics, are really not sure how they should deal with the first major work of both fiction written by a woman, uh, that's filled with scenes of erotic violence by men against women. What, what are we supposed to do with that? Um, on the other hand, uh, I would argue that the Urania contains a whole load of erotic descriptions. Just pick out the ones where men are 
acting uh, in that way against women, uh, does not give us a very balanced picture of the novel as a whole. You've got men captivated and abused by women, also in this book. Okay? You've got homosexual scenes, you've got proud huntresses, you've got very powerful women. Um, Urania herself is a powerful woman, so is Limena in her own way later on. Uh, then you've got women glorying in the violence that's being committed against men. So it's, it's not just that she's pandering to the male gaze, to say, uh, you know, men will enjoy reading that sort of thing because I know that men fantasize about the women that they hate. Men, men hate women in this period, so uh, I know that that's going to be a sort of, it's going to make them want to read my work. No, the, the book contains a, a all kind, a whole range of, you could say, I mean, you could say there's something for everybody in it. Okay, it's not just focusing on that particular, particular aspect. So, uh, I think to get a clear understanding of um, of the book, instead of saying that it's pandering to the male gaze, I think you'd want to say that it's an assertion of female sexuality, which, as I say, would be something that the 17th century was much more able to cope with than the, eight, the 19th, certainly than the 19th century, and even perhaps in the 18th, although we, we do get some, um, some sense of uh, female sexuality in the 18th century. So uh, rather than seeing it as pandering to the male gaze, I would see it as uh, a, a more general expression of uh, female sexuality. And basically then, uh, we should not underestimate what women like Mary Roth and Ephraim Ben uh, achieved during that period. Um, and yet, you know, had you heard their names before you came into this classroom? Probably not. Okay. Uh, they're, they're only really beginning to become part of sort of the study of English literature, which has been so focused on male writers. But uh, some quite important women writers have just been left out of the picture altogether. Uh, in, in Mary Roth's case, it's more understandable because her book was withdrawn from, the first part was withdrawn from publication, and the second part she never published. But in uh, Afro Ben's case, uh, she was a, a widely published, widely read, uh, widely influential uh, writer from her period and certainly deserves um, wider, broader study uh, in English literature departments today. So, um, they were challenging male hegemony. The society was very male dominated and uh, women were dependent on men, both economically and in the eyes of the law, uh, a, woman's a woman's very identity was seen in terms of her relationship to a man. She was somebody's father, she was somebody's husband, she was somebody's brother, she was somebody's son. She was never just somebody. But by taking up a pen, women were demonstrating that the power of the word did not just belong in the hands of men, that uh, women could also uh, make, um, uh, take, take power uh, you know the saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, the pen gave women an opportunity to, to show uh, how mighty they could be. Uh, Abraham Cowley uh, says uh, something quite revealing in his um, dedicatory verses to uh, the preface of the poems of Catherine Phillips. Um, the female author is a challenge to male assumptions of superiority. He says it like this, we allowed your beauty and we did submit to all the tyrannies of it. Ah, cruel sex, will you depose us too in wit? Okay, we've already accepted that you women are more beautiful than men, all right? And we, we, we accept all the tyranny that that imposes on us, all the, all the heartache that we go through, loving women for their beauty, and that it brings us heartache. We accept all that, but you're gonna turn out to be cleverer than us as well, okay? Wit. In this case, meaning intelligence, cleverness, all right? Will you depose us to in wit? You're also going to beat us in that area? We thought that at least there we, we had the edge. We, we, were, we were better than you women. But if you're going to write such um, wonderful poetry as this, uh, it puts our superiority, our mental superiority, in doubt. 
Okay, so uh, I think that kind of sums it up rather neatly. Uh, if you want to find out more about early modern women, then I suggest you take a look at um, the University of Pennsylvania's web pages, which has a celebration of women writers and gives uh, a comprehensive list together um, you know, with, with links and everything. So it gives you a, a you, can, you can really find out about how many writers there were, and you can get details about them by following the links. Okay. So if you're interested in this subject. I suggest you take a look at that website. There are other places you could go, but that might be a useful starting point. Um, if you want to look at secondary sources, um, well, um, there's a, a woman in book history bibliography website that, that gives you lots of criticism, it gives you links to uh, criticism uh, and works that have been published about early modern women and their writing. So those two sources will help you if you want to explore this topic any further. Okay.